Finally getting somewhere with vamping. <laughs> Hey everybody, my name is Mark. Welcome back to 2000 Hours of Banjo. Before I get into anything, just a little bit of housekeeping. I did mount the, the sign, it's looking good. I really like it. Again, I have the remote so I can change the colors however I want. Um, I'm feeling a bit green today, so I'm gonna keep it on green, but I may change it up from video to video. Also, you may notice a little bit that I've kind of moved things around to reorganize my banjo corner that resides inside my gym. This is just to help kind of create some space so Mrs. 2KHB can get her exercise in the gym and not be, because my I was starting to overflow more so into the gym. I moved the, the dumbbell bench over and now there's a lot more space. For, for us to use the rest of the of the room and, and still keep a nice tidy corner for my banjo practice and for making these videos. Anyway, and oh, and the last thing is, I did reach out to Tom Neckville of Neckville Banjos. And I know that I'm at, um, what am I at? I'm at 646 hours, we're at 646 hours which is not that close to a thousand hours, but I wanted to reach out to him anyway. And he was, he's so gracious and so friendly. He, he emailed me back. He wanted to know more about me and, and get an idea of what, you know, uh, what brought me to Neckville, why I'm so interested in Neckville banjo and uh, other, other information so we can start tailoring a banjo for me. I did tell him that I'm, I'm kind of looking for more of his lighter models that has the, the timber tronic or the wooden tone ring rather than uh, a metal one and makes the banjo a whole lot lighter. This uh, during good time is about four and a half to five pounds uh, with the added armrest the, um, and all the other stuff. And even then, even at five pounds, which is very, very light, it, um, it hurts my collarbone. If you don't recall, I mentioned in another video that I, um, uh, I shattered my collarbone in a motorcycle accident and I have a couple of plates and screws in there. I have actually uh, seven screws in there, which is hilarious because my wife who plays roller derby shattered her collarbone. I should say one of her, her teammates shattered her, <laughs> her collarbone for her. Same collarbone, left side, and she's got a plate and six screws. So, you know, I hate to be a one-upper, but I've got seven screws to her six. Anyway, I told him about that, so I wanted a lighter model and maybe a, a more padded um, strap to go with it so that when I'm standing and I'm practicing for two hours, it doesn't, it doesn't dig in because it can, it can really, I can really start to feel that hardware after about two hours. All right, enough of that. Boil them cabbage down, backup vamping. I've been working on that. This is, this is still part of Eli Gilbert's 30 days of banjo. Now it's a year and three quarters and I'm still working on that 30 days of banjo. And I'll tell you, every once in a while, and if you haven't come across this, you probably will, certainly I do, you're gonna come across a technique, and for me, vamping is one of them, that just, takes a long time. I just have to chip away at it. It's not, it's just something that I'm not getting. I'm not, uh, it's not progressing as fast as some of the other stuff. Some things I, I learn and pick up pretty quick, particularly now, uh, but other stuff like vamping, it just takes so much time. So I kind of park it in the back of my practices and chip away at it here and there no judgment, just do the practice. And then over time, I think it's getting better. I'm gonna go ahead and insert a clip of how I was playing this backup a few months ago. And you can take a look at it right there. And that's how I've been playing. And hopefully you can tell that I'm sounding a little bit better. 
that said, I'm actually adding quite a bit more practice of vamping into my practice routine. And that's because of two things. One, because I'm getting faster with the boil them cabbage down vamping back up, I do want to incorporate it in the rest of the boil them cabbage down song that I've been practicing. So if you haven't heard, how I practice boil them cabbage down is, And that's where I end with the up the neck back up. From here, now that I'm getting used to or getting faster with the, the vamping, I wanna, I wanna learn to go from this point and jump into the vamping. So I'm doing a lot of loops of just from up the neck G chord to G chord. And hopefully learning that and getting that down will help launch me into the rest of the vamping back up for Boil Them Cabbage Down, which is great. The other thing that I've been chipping away at is the 10 ways to play back up by Mike Hedding. And this is 10 ways to play back up in the key of G using the chord progression of Wagon Wheel. And how that goes is... And that's one through five. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm a little cold <laughs> today. I actually uh, typically do these videos right after I've been practicing. Um, this time today, I've, I went and got dinner and then am recording this video. And yes, just over dinner, I can grow cold. It's amazing how quickly uh, one grows cold and needs to warm up again. It's, it's kind of, it, it kind of sucks actually. But if I have anything in my teeth, it's because I thought making this video was more important than flossing after dinner. So that's, that was one through five of Mike Hedding's five ways to play backup. The sixth way, which I'm trying to progress through all 10 ways, the sixth way is unfortunately vamping. So I'm going to be stuck on way number six for quite some time. Thankfully, some of it's a bit familiar. We start with um, the G chord again. D. And then he does something different. He does from there. And then to E minor, C. And instead of barring it, he puts all four fingers down. Back to G. D. C. 
Sí. And then rinse, repeat. Um, and, and that's going to take a bit of practice. It's going to take a bit of practice just to get that down. And then it's going to take a bit more practice to incorporate it with the other ways, the first five ways of playing back up, just like it's going to take practice to incorporate the vamping for boil them cabbage down into um, the rest of the boil them cabbage down. I also forgot something else with housekeeping that I wanted to talk about. I want to do a uh, kind of like a comments on comments section of my videos. I'll be putting that at the end of the videos and it's basically just you guys make such good comments that I want to respond to them and sometimes I do respond them to them in the um, just right there in the comment field of the video but others that I, I, I want to discuss in a YouTube video like this and I think I'll be doing that towards the end of the video so if you want to stick around for the comments on your comments uh, stick to the end of the video to see if I'm talking about something that you may have written. All right, so moving on. Uh, that is the vamping background backup that I'm working on. Uh, again, it's one of those techniques that simply I just need to chip away at. A lot like the 3-2 pull-off. Ah. Oh, well, not bad. Not bad. So getting it nice and plucky without hitting the adjacent, uh, the second string is, is just tricky for me. And so I've been working on that for quite some time. Thankfully, I am now working on a new song that incorporates the 3-2 pull-off a whole bunch. So I'm going to be getting a lot of practice on the 3-2 pull-off. Uh, and I have been for the past few weeks and moving on to the future. And that song is Eastbound and Down. Uh, this is Eddie Collins, um, what do you call it? arrangement of Eastbound and Down that I got from his website. Again, you can go to his website, watch any of his videos. If there's any song that he plays that you like, you can simply just email him and uh, let him know and send a couple bucks his way to his PayPal account or, his, or something like that, and he'll email you the arrangement. So uh, you'll see that when I'm doing uh, Eastbound and Down, and, and bear with me, I've, I've been working on this for like the past two and a half, three weeks, and I just barely started getting it memorized so I don't have to look at the tablature, which means I still need to peek into the tablature occasionally, but the vast majority I have it memorized. So I may get this down, I may not, but I'll tell you, that's like one of the first milestones that I love about learning a new song. Learning a new song is very intimidating. Uh, you look at all that tablature and if you're as bad at reading tab as I am, like you really have to pick your way through it. It's so slow. But that first milestone of just getting all that tab memorized, the whole song memorized, feels so good, encourages you to progress even more. Uh, the second milestone I would say is, well at least for me again, is that when I first start playing the song it doesn't sound anything like the song so when I start getting up to speed or getting some level of smoothness where a string of bars actually start to sound like it's supposed to sound that again is very very encouraging and and motivates me to push forward with that song so let's see if I can do this going to be a challenge.
And then it goes on back into the verse again or the chorus or whatever. That, I think, uh, obviously a mess. <laughs> but I think I got all the notes correct on that one. I think I got the tablature down on that one. So pretty good. I'm, I'm really proud of myself for getting that down. Uh, this was is tricky. A lot of new stuff. Uh, it's my first bar chord. This is the A chord. Lots of 3-2 pull-off. This D chord, uh, it's, apparently it's a famous Scruggs lick. That's, that's taken quite a bit to learn. Anyway, so... So a lot, a lot of new stuff on that song, and I, I really, really like it. It's, it's good, and again, it's a, it's Eastbound and Down. It's a theme to Smoking the Band. I like talk about bringing back memories and watching that movie with my, my brothers and my dad. I love that movie. Um, anyway, okay, moving forward. Wayfaring Stranger. Um, Wayfaring Stranger has been surprisingly tricky, and I've made it trickier. And I don't know if that's necessarily a good thing. I've, sometimes I swear I feel like I've got, you know, me on one shoulder and saying it's like, do it the easy way, keep doing it the easy way. And then I have my instructor on my other shoulder, my instructor, Mike, uh, Mike Leatherman. Info on his, his lessons in the, in the description below. And he's telling me to do it the hard way because it'll pay dividends in the future. So Mike, if you're watching, this is this is an honor of you. I'm trying to find. I'm trying to. I'm trying the harder path with Wayfaring Stranger, and this is what I mean. Um, when I get to the neck walk of Wayfaring Stranger, that's how. I've been doing it, but now I want to do the full chord, the full F chord. So I'm getting that fourth, um, where I'm getting that ring finger down too. And that makes it a lot harder. Because it comes again, I gotta get to the F chord again. Uh. Actually, that's not what's next. So anyway, that that part of the song, and I've been I've been working on it, but man, it's coming slow. This song is coming really slow.
It's coming along though. <laughs> it's just really hard. <laughs> All right, so that's that's Wayfaring Stranger. Um, something else that came up. Uh, I was talking to my brother. This is my twin. If you don't, uh, I don't think I've ever mentioned it. I actually have a twin brother, and and our fiftieth birthday is coming up in November. Um, which reminds me of another thing. Somebody bought themselves an early 50th uh, birthday gift. It happens to be a Triumph motorcycle. That's a Triumph motorcycle. So I've been having fun with my early birthday gifts. Hopefully not to break any more <laughs> collarbones. I don't want to break any more collarbones. <laughs> anyway, uh, I was talking to my brother and he, he's been on and off trying to learn flamenco guitar, which is very, very difficult. Uh, he's also one that loves the challenge. And he was asking me a question about um, how do I know when to start learning a new song? And uh, I don't really have a solid answer for him. I'd be curious for you guys, like when you're learning how to play a banjo or any instrument, like when do you decide when it's time for new material? Uh, I've, I've tried to give it some thought, and here's one thing I do know, and this comes again from my instructor, Mike Leatherman, which is I don't wait until I have my existing material down perfect. I don't do that, because if I did that, I would still only be at, well, Eli Gilbert's 30 Days of Banjo, because uh, I'm still working on that material. So I do push for when I've got the, a lot of the material, like above 50% down, if I were to rate it on any type of scale, 50, 60, 70, once I've got it down pretty good. Um, basically, I'm trying to, I'm still, the more material, the more I have to manage time with my practice. So I want to be able to play it fast enough so I can get the reps I need for practice. And then if I've got time at the end, then it's time to start learning new material, like a new song. So that's kind of when I start to do it. What I'm finding out is a lot of new material happens to help out old material as well, and vice versa. Obviously, old material, knowing your old skills, helps out with new material, but the reverse is also true. Like with um, Eastbound and Down, there's a ton of 3-2 pull-offs. Well, that's been helping out with um, Wagon Wheel. Because there's 3-2 pull-offs and Wagon Wheel, and I'm feeling more confident with those 3-2 pull-offs and Wagon Wheel thanks to at least the last three weeks two and a half to three weeks of doing the practice with Eastbound and Down. Same thing goes for Foggy Mountain Breakdown. There is a portion of Foggy Mountain Breakdown that is very similar to a portion of Eastbound and Down. In fact, it's so similar that I was playing Foggy Mountain Breakdown earlier. That last part is so familiar to Eastbound and Down that I tend to jump right into Eastbound and, <laughs> Eastbound and Down while I'm trying to play um, Foggy Mountain Breakdown instead. <laughs> so, so I've caught myself several times and just there I did it again. I started playing Eastbound and Down at the tail end of that uh, because some of the, the, the licks map over so fluidly that I'll just break into the other song, which is good and bad. Good because it helps with getting that technique down, but bad because my brain's getting confused and it's jumping tracks into another song and off I go. 
So anyway, so that's that's that. Lots of good good material. Lots of I'm enjoying Eastbound and Down a whole lot. All right, what else is up? Oh, I'm sorry. To finish my thought on when to start a new song. Uh, so that's that's one of the reasons my instructor tells me why it. You don't want to wait. You don't want to wait until you got something perfect to move on to another song. You're just gonna spin your wheels because what what is perfect anyway? Not making mistakes at what speed then? Do you have to hit 200 beats per minute? Um, and, and if it's gonna wait until 200 beats per minute, man, I've been practicing. When we're at, we're at 600 and what was it again? 646 hours. I can't hit 200 beats per minute yet. Like anyway, so move on to the to new material when it feels right and if you move on to new material and it's too tough or it's too much you can let it go and you can you can like all right it's not time for me to learn that song yet i'll pick it up another time i did that with um man of constant sorrow uh i remember i was learning man of constant sorrow last year and it was it was just too tough tough and my instructor just says you know now it's just not the time and we'll get it later and I, I am learning it later and it and it's coming along pretty good granted that one wasn't so great but other times when you guys aren't watching it's perfect it's totally awesome <laughs> so go ahead and grab a new song and if it turns out that you're not ready for it that's fine shelve it and get back to it later there's no shame in that all right comments on comments so this is the section that I want to introduce into the YouTube videos where I comment on comments that you guys make on prior videos. One of the comments that I got recently was, actually this is the second one that I've gotten on this, is speed drills. Now, uh, my instructor, Mike Leatherman, I think responded to that first comment. Sorry, a piece of, what is that, a dust moat flying, flying around in front of my face? Anyway, he did comment on that comment, but then there was another comment just recently about speed drills so I want to demonstrate exactly what I'm doing for speed drills and tell you whether I think it's helping or not. First of all, speed drills for me, um, well, I'm going to say that they're not my favorite and then I'm going to tell you why. So for the speed drill, you're going to want your metronome because this is how you're going to tell, this is how you're going to do it. You're going to set your metronome and you want to set it at a very fairly easy pace, okay? Let's say it's at 100 beats per minute. Actually for this, let's, let's start at 120. So that's, you, you cleaned it, played it good at whatever speed you're playing at. Uh, this is, um, will the circle be unbroken? Good. Then you advance. You advance 10 beats per minute or whatever you want to do. I'm going to jump and see if I could do it at uh, advance 20 beats per minute to 140. So this is 140 beats per minute.
then we're moving along even faster. Let's go ahead. Let's do another 20 and go up to 160 beats per minute. Sounding pretty fast. Okay, so at that point I'm starting to make mistakes, right? So I can back it down a little bit, back to like 150 or something like that. Incrementally build that speed up with your metronome to your speed limit, whatever that may be. The idea here is to work yourself up nice and warm, slowing that pace to a faster, faster, faster pace. And eventually you're going to get to a beats per minute where you can't play it smoothly. You can't play it clean. You're having problems, okay? Um, this is at 160. I can tell you that when I'm properly warmed up, I can do 160 beats per minute. Of, will the circle be unbroken? I think I actually get to 170 if I'm properly, you know, if I properly go up the ladder uh, 10, be 10 beats per minute, but I don't want to bore you with the whole drill. Once you hit your speed limit, let's say it's 170, you hit your speed limit, that's when no more metronome. Turn the metronome off. And now what you're gonna do is you're gonna play that song, Reckless Abandon, as fast as your fingers can go. Don't worry if you screw up. Don't worry if your timing is not good. Just play fast. Now the pro, and you, they, there's a couple of keys to this. A, don't judge yourself. Just play as fast as you can. Don't mind the mistakes. Two is, you don't want to do this for very long. Maximum of a minute to two minutes per song that you're doing a speed drill on. Uh, you don't want to undo any work. You just want to get your fingers used to that fast twitch muscle movement. So uh, you don't want to screw up any timing or anything like that. And this won't screw up your timing as long as you keep it to like two minutes or less. Um, and, and just go for it. The other thing is you're going to have... <laughs> It sounds awful. The, the part where, where I say don't judge yourself, that's probably the hardest part of the speed drill. I'm gonna go ahead and demonstrate. It's gonna sound awful, but this is, this is a speed drill. Get the picture <laughs> it's a mess it's an absolute mess part of the reason why i don't like doing it because i'm sure my wife is in the other room thinking i'm getting very angry at my practice i'm i'm about ready to rage quit or break my banjo over my knee and i'm not that's just part of the drill <laughs> and it feels really uncomfortable but i will tell you that even though i don't like doing this drill and even though um, I don't do it all the time as much as I should, I have to admit it works. Um, with Cripple Creek, I think I'm capping out at 190 beats per minute, almost 195. So I'm really close to breaking the 200 beat per minute mile, miles per hour <laughs> speed limit. Um, or threshold or milestone or whatever with Cripple Creek doing this drill this way. And again, it's start your metronome, start in an easy pace, slowly build it up, walk, climb that ladder until you get to a beats per minute. That's your speed wall where you're making uh, either mild or extreme mis mistakes. You just can't fix it regardless of how many times you're, you're trying to repeat it turn off the metronome and then just go full blast as fast as you can and, and for no more than two minutes and then move on to the next song and do that for the next song so i will do that now here's something that i do that um, my instructor didn't necessarily say but i i think he would agree do this for the songs that you that you know and you know well so i will do it for boil them cabbage down i will do it for cripple creek i will do it for cumberland gap i will do it for will, will the circle be unbroken and that's, those are the songs that I'll do those speed drills for. 
I won't do it for any of the other ones because I don't know them well enough. I don't have uh, the capacity or the ability to play those songs cleanly at, at you know pretty moderate to high pace to really do a speed drill with those songs just yet. When I do get more comfortable with those songs, when I do more have capability, I will start including those into the speed drill, but not just yet. So I'm really just doing the speed drill with four songs right now. Uh, and it's helping. It's, ho it's certainly helping with those songs. The way that my instructor puts it, it's like, you want to play so fast that you're, you're, you're not trying, you're not remembering the song. You're just, it's almost, you're playing it out of reflex. Um, and, and you just knock it out. The other nice thing is obviously I don't want to play a lot of these songs at, you know, 170 beats per minute or whatever. Playing it that fast helps me play it at a slower pace that I do want to play it at much, much sm more smoothly. All right, uh, another comment. Um, a couple of you commented about my right hand technique or my right hand positioning. And I will say thank you very much for bringing that up. There was a video a while ago and my, my right hand technique, I've been struggling with it for a bit, but um, I was really almost cupping the bridge, it seems like. And that was causing my attack angle on my picks to, to go on the side. I was smoothing out and sharpening the inner curve of my picks. And I've been working really hard to bring that wrist up and make it more straight. Um, and one of the things that I did was I, I shortened my strap um, and to bring that up. And I'm keeping my, at the neck of my banjo, at a, a good 45 or even maybe more acute than a 45. And that's, that's really helped with my tone and my picking hand and wrist being a bit more straight. It probably could be a little bit more straight, but right now if I go, if I go really straight or even, you know, over, overextend it, it's, it's pretty uncomfortable. So my comfort zone right here with good tone, it, and it sounds good. It, it sounds really good. Trying to do Cumberland Gap, that's not coming to me. Anyways, I think it sounds really good, uh, and I, I'm going to continue to work on that to see if I can improve it even more. But thank you again for those comments that caught that, and I, again, I'll be working on it. Last comment: um, a guy named, well, at least his his name on on the YouTube comment is just CB. So a guy named CB made a comment a little bit ago about how he was learning how to play, practicing banjo for six years, didn't like how it was going, stopped for a year, and then took it up again. This is really, really interesting to me. This, I, this guy must have a lot of valuable input on taking the wrong path, how to correct the path, having the stones to just like take the break and reset and start over. It's pretty amazing. So I do want to get in touch with this guy and in a way kind of interview him. Uh, I'm not exactly how that's going to come out on a YouTube video, but we'll figure something out. Um, even if he, if he even wants to be on a YouTube video, but I think, I think he's got a trove of valuable insight that I think all of us could benefit from. Uh, so I'll try to pry that out of him and, 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 and share it with everybody so we don't make the same mistakes and we can learn some lessons from him. I think that would be very important. All right, I think this video is probably way, way long, much longer than most of my videos, but it's been a bit, it's been over three weeks, I think, since my last video. So a lot of catching up to do. I got some practice to do and some flossing to do. I can feel a bit of meat in my teeth. <laughs> I will see you next time. Take care. Bye.